We are recording the interview of Natalie D'Alessandro. The interview is being conducted by Jennifer Seavey from Wright State University's Veteran Voices Project. This interview is being recorded at Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio. It is 10 a.m. on January 23rd, 2016. Okay, so uh, when and where were you born? Um, Wilkesboro, Pennsylvania in 1979. <laughs> <laughs> um, and who are your parents and what were their occupations? Uh, my mother is Kathleen D'Alessandro and she was a teacher. She's since retired a few years ago. And my dad is Frank D'Alessandro and he was a business consultant. He's also retired. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you have any siblings? I do not have siblings. No. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> um, did anyone in your family serve in the military? Yes, my paternal grandfather, who was a POW during World War II um, under the Japanese, um, and my paternal great-grandfather, who was in, who served in World War I, um, and he served over in France during World War I. Wow. Um, and I've since learned, after doing some genealogy recently, that I had a um, relative on my mother's side that served during the Civil War. Wow, that's amazing. Do you know what they did while they were serving? I haven't been able to figure that out yet. I'm still just starting with that uh, research. Sure, yeah. that's exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so what were you doing before you entered the service? Um, well, I had graduated a few years earlier with my bachelor's degree and wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So I was actually in um, management of a convenience store and I worked also in uh, retail for a few years. So I did that and then went to talk to a recruiter and the rest was history. Okay, all right. <laughs> Um, so, uh, where were you during 9-11? Um, when it happened, I was still sleeping <laughs> at home, but um, I had a long distance a boyfriend at the time, and he called me and woke me up and uh, told me what was going on, and I turned on the TV. So, once I woke up, I was watching all that on TV. Um, I was in Kentucky at the time. Where was he at? He was in Norway. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. Was he in the military, too, then? He was not. Oh, okay. <laughs> Um, well, what were your thoughts when you when you heard that? Well, obviously, um, it's never something anybody wants to see happening anywhere, regardless of what country it is. So I do have relatives that live just over the river um, in New Jersey. So my first thought was, are they okay? Um, they don't normally go into the city. Um, I did have a cousin who worked in the city at the time. He was okay. Um, obviously, so that was my first thought. And of course, hopefully we could find out what happened and everybody else uh, was that we that they could help find was was okay and that it would be hopefully minimal damage but we know what happened in the end sure yeah <laughs> okay so um what branch of the military did you serve in i served in the air force okay uh, were you active duty guard reserve i was active duty for just under eight years and i did serve in the reserves for a little while but i'm not in the reserves anymore okay um so why did you choose the air force well, um, when I had spoken, when I first spoke to a recruiter, it was because they had come into my store that I was managing. Oh, okay. So um, I didn't actually have intentions of joining the military, but you know, through talking with the recruiters, um, I ended up going to the Air Force because I wanted to fly. Um, I was not a pilot, but I did end up flying once, eventually once I got in. So that's why I chose the Air Force. It's more likely that you'll fly in the Air Force than the other branches, sure. even though they do have opportunities. <laughs> um, so you enlisted or were you commissioned? I was commissioned. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, did you go through any of the like training? I did. Um, in May of 2004, I went to the Air Force's officer training school in Maxwell Air Force Base, Alabama. And that's a 12-week course. And then at the end of that is when you get commissioned. Okay. So mm -hmm. what was that experience like? Oh my gosh, that was insane because um, I, um, I didn't have any direct relation with the military up to that point because my grandfather was the most recent relative to have been in the military, and that was in World War II. So um, I didn't know exactly what to expect, uh, but there were other students in officer training school that had either been prior enlisted, um, other students who um, were just so excited about going through the opportunity that we kind of relied on each other to get each other through. Um, it was um, not as... Um, strict as you might expect like when you see with boot camp mm -hmm. uh, we did have a little bit more freedom than individuals that go through boot camp and enlist um, but we did still have rules um, you had to lock anything up even a penny 
um, into a little lockbox, otherwise you would get demerits. So it's very similar to what uh, might happen in boot camp. So totally different from what I, uh, the rest of my life had been like. <laughs> but sure. it definitely prepared us for what we needed to do. Good, good. So uh, do you have any like memories, uh, anything that you specifically enjoyed or didn't enjoy? <laughs> from officer training school? Yeah. Um, I made a lot of really close friends, uh, and we do still keep in touch to this day. Okay. Um, uh, we, we connected because you go through an experience that not many people can can explain to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I think that's why we made deep relationships with certain people um, and I still keep in touch with them. Occasionally uh, if they come here uh, into Dayton, Ohio to write, write Patterson and they know I'm here we'll get together. So um, really more of the long lasting relationships is what I uh, would take out of that. Sure. Did you uh, like your instructors and everything? I did. I mean they had to be strict because yeah. they were teaching us but I have kept in touch with some of them as well. Oh wow that's yes. great. Yeah it's you, great. You don't hear that too often. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, so uh, what was your MOS? Um, when I commissioned, I went to Tyndall Air Force Base in Florida to become what's called an air battle manager. And my MOS in the Air Force, it's called an AFSC, um, Air Force Specialty Code, same thing as an MOS, but it was a 13 Bravo, uh, and that means air battle manager. Um, an air battle manager is kind of an overall term, kind of like you might say you're an engineer, but there's different types of engineers. Okay. So you have the air battle manager, and under that there's opportunities to become an air weapons officer, an electronic combat officer, a, uh, an air surveillance officer, um, or a mission crew commander, and a few others that you can do on the ground, like air liaison officer where you work kind of with the Army or, or okay. uh, with those individuals as well. So um, what exactly were your like typical duties with <laughs> those kinds of jobs? Um, well, be, as an air battle manager, the most likely opportunity you're going to have is to be flying in what's called the E3 AWACS um, Airborne Warning and Control System. It's a Boeing 70, a modified Boeing 707 with a, a radar dome on top. Um, can I show a picture? Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this is what it looks like. Um, this is actually uh, this was me in when we were in Barbados oh. for a deployment into Barbados, which was. Not very rough, but this was <laughs> no, <laughs> considered. I didn't consider it deployment, but that's what they called it. Uh, but this is the seven, the the AWACS, uh, E3 AWACS, um, with the radar dome on top. Um, my duties as an air weapons officer was um, basically we monitored the sky. So the radar dome would be turned on by the airborne radar technician. Um, we would be able to see pretty far out in the skies with the radar, and we would monitor the skies. Um, for example, on this particular um, uh, deployment. We were in Barbados to help um, secure the skies for the president when he was down at the Summit of Americas in South America. So we had a few jets down there to do that. Um, so that was the duties of, of the air weapons officer. Um, as an electronic combat officer, which I also served as um, a few years later, um, I would um, analyze the data that came in with the radar. And I'd be able to identify different pieces of data on the aircraft that we saw on the scopes. Oh, so, so like what kind of information would you pull from that then? Um, well, a lot of that's classified, oh, okay. but no, that's okay. <laughs> but um, we would pull the appropriate information that we would need to get to the decision makers. Okay. So I would have a laptop next to me that I carried on the jet with, with um, classified information on it, and I would compare what I saw coming in on the scope on the computer from the radar data and compare that to what was on the laptop and get that data to the mission crew commander okay. who um, ran the mission crew on the aircraft um, and then he would get that to the appropriate resources either on the ground or sometimes another aircraft okay. or to the decision makers that would tell us what we need to do next. So do you know like, uh, and I don't know if you can share this, um, so the information that you pulled from that, do you know uh, like what the results were after you uh, shared that information? Like are you able to share like um, it would depend on the situation. Um, normally we would know the results because um, if I identified the aircraft with certain criteria and we passed it on, as the mission crew commander passed it on, um, the decisions, it really depends. If they would get back up to us, then we would know. Okay. Um, if not, we wouldn't. <laughs> sure, sure. And it would also help. Um, I'm sorry, it would also help the air weapons officers because we also helped each other on the jet to determine what their next steps would be in uh, in their jobs. So would they like would that give like the signal to like shoot a plane down or something? Um, it could lead to that if you were in combat. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. And that there is a an extensive um, 
uh, there are extensive rules of engagement, ROE. Um, it's not as simple as um, us identifying and saying, that's a hostile aircraft, go shoot it down. We can't just do that. There are many different people along the way, which is why we have to get the, um, the data to the people on the ground who then tell us, okay, you've verified, you've done XYZ, we've done XYZ, now you need to tell aircraft so-and-so that either they need to handle the situation or back off. So okay. there was extensive ROE for that. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that, that sounds really exciting. <laughs> It was interesting. <laughs> um, so those two, were those the only ones that you uh, were doing? Those were the two jobs that I did, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> so um, how did you adapt to the military life since you said you had never like, even like, considered it before? Um, when I went to training, for my initial training in Florida, there were a lot of students there going through the training, so I tried to uh, build relationships with them, and because there were a lot of us there, we all kind of relied on each other, kind of like the officer training school. So for me, I believe it was a little bit easier than it, than it may have been, because we had other people going through the same things, other people with the same experience in the military as me, um, some people, of course, with extensive experience. So I was able to kind of leverage um, what uh, relationships I could build with them um, and when you're finished with that training in this particular career field you go to um, Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma and you do even more training so uh, it, I kind of uh, just built those relationships um, asked questions to the people I um, trusted and respected and kind of went from there. Cool. Um, what uh, and I don't know if you can share this either like the additional trainings that you were receiving like can you give an example? of the training to become an air battle manager? Yes. Sure. Um, well, the training that we had in Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida, um, that, was, that was ground training. So we were not flying at that point. So we would go into, we had uh, a mix of classroom work, academic work, and um, simulator training. So we would have maybe, as an example, um, the morning we would be instructed by some uh, instructor air battle managers who are stationed there to teach you. So you'd be instructed maybe in the morning by uh, somebody doing that and then the afternoon you would have simulator training and at first you would have somebody behind you teaching you the different concepts and then eventually you'd be tested on it um, and you would get what's called a check ride um, that is kind of an evaluation um, and you'd of course be graded on that and try and obviously you'd hope to pass um, and most people did. If there were if people did not pass that, they would get additional training and more opportunities to, to uh, pass and excel. Um, so that would be an example of the training I had at Tyndall Air Force Base. Um, we didn't start flying training until we moved to Tinker Air Force Base where the aircraft are stationed. And then we would go through training there. It could take, um, it could take six months to a year to complete that. Um, and there you also have more training in this classroom. Uh, and then, and of course, tests throughout, just like a regular school class. Um, and then at one point, once you're done with that, you go over to the flying squadron and you start training with um, a qualified instructor behind you, uh, putting all your ground training together and actually controlling aircraft in the sky um, or doing whatever your job might be. Because there were plenty of jobs on the aircraft, not just what we did. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's exciting. Mm -hmm. So were you like, did you... Um were you jumping out of planes at any point? Or? <laughs> no, we, we did not have jobs where we jumped out of planes. Okay. I did learn, though, because you have to learn all about your aircraft. Um, so you, you, and you also have to make sure that you take care of yourself and you learn life support skills and egress training. And if your aircraft um, lands on water, what, what do you do in those situations when you're trying to get out? So you do have to learn that stuff as well. Okay. Um, but uh, we did not have to jump out of our airplane. <laughs> I did learn, though, that in the past there used to be a chute in the bottom where, um, and it's not done anymore, where if you, they needed to uh, go out the bottom of the plane, you jump out the bottom. But the, I always question, because there's air, antenna all over the airplane, if you jumped out the bottom, you'd hit all the antenna. <laughs> oh. So, but that is not done anymore. <laughs> Maybe that's why, right? <laughs> okay, so um, were you able to keep up with the, the physical aspects of everything? Like, um, I know some people, they either get injured or, you know, they just can't keep up. Did you receive, like, extra training for that? or? Um, I, 
I was able to keep up with the physical aspects. I did have some knee problems basically from running mm -hmm. um, and I, I did have to have like physical therapy for my knee um, but that didn't actually, um, that wasn't because of my job. My job flying an aircraft was mostly sedentary, sitting in a chair looking at a scope. So I wasn't having to every day carry a pack everywhere, like you see the, the army on the ground and those individuals. Um, so I didn't have too much physically that affected me. Um, the, I guess one uh, example where it was kind of tough for me was having to go through survival school. It's called um, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. Siri is what aviators call it. Um, that was very tough. Um, that was a three-week course of both ground and water survival, and you and you are you do experience a mock POW camp after you've camped in the woods and you've learned all that stuff. And in that situation, you have to carry a lot of gear. And so, for somebody as little as I am, and I'm quite little, um, it was a lot of gear to carry. But you don't go out there on your own during the training. You're there with other people, so you help each other out as well while you're learning these survival skills. So are you able to like share like what kind of experiences like they they put you through at all? Unfortunately, I'm not able okay. to explain I that. Yeah, I had to ask. I had to <laughs> I ask. Apologize. That's just pure curiosity right here. <laughs> um, so okay, so where all did you serve? I served in uh, Panama City, Florida, at Tyndall Air Force Base, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, at Tinker Air Force Base. And then I PCS here to Wright Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio, and that's when I transitioned out of the service after I PCS here. Okay. Okay. Um, so the places that you served abroad, uh, what memories do you have from those experiences? Oh my. Um, there were a few opportunities to um, to go see the culture in the places where we traveled. I I enjoy traveling anyway, and I love learning about cultures and other people. I think it broadens people's horizons and it helps them be more tolerant of, of other cultures. So I think the experiences that I really enjoyed traveling on TDYs or deployments was when we were able to go off base or off uh, campus, wherever we might have been staying, um, and to go experience the culture and the people of those areas. Um, and then bring it back and, you know, show pictures or, or tell people stories. And I think that would probably be what I got most out of it. Okay. Like, um, so, it, like, when you guys left, um, to go have some fun, like what did you all do? Um, it depended on where we were. Um, for example, when we were deployed to the desert for OEF and OIF, um, you had a time, it was very difficult to get off the base in the first place because you're, you're there for combat, yeah. okay? So you have to, of course, follow all the rules and um, stay there for a certain amount of time before you're all even allowed off. But some of the things that, that the Air Force did offer for um, individuals in way of morale was they had um, different um, uh, coordinated trips off base. So they had people that were, that were deployed there who were designated to put these day trips together, like maybe go to the mall or, I mean, because when you're deployed, you, you're, not, you know, you're not spending money, you're not going shopping like you might when you're at home. So even, um, you usually think of women want to go to the mall, but a lot of times the men would go to the mall too, you know, <laughs> to buy maybe a purse for their wife, you know, stuff like that. Um, there were a couple of uh, day trips that I was able to go on where we took a chartered bus to um, uh, another, well, we took a chartered bus up to Dubai actually for the day. Uh -huh. Yeah, and um, it was about an hour, an hour and a half from where we were at. Um, it was coordinated through the base. Um, and there were about, I don't know, 40 to 45 people on it who were there for deployment and we were able to go do a little sightseeing. Um, and there were some other, uh, for example, when we were in um, Barbados, we just kind of did some sightseeing there as well. That sounds yeah. like a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so, were your duties different while you were deployed as compared to back home? My primary duties were not. Uh, my primary duty was being that air weapons officer or that electronic combat officer, whichever position I was in at the time. Um, and that we call primary duties what we're trained for. But we always had secondary duties. For example, we had a security office that dealt with security clearances and, and those type of things, operations security. That might be a secondary duty for somebody. So if you have that duty at home as the security manager of your unit, you likely were going to have it when you were deployed as well. Um, but your primary duty was flying and getting that mission completed that you were on. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so did you witness any combat and if you're willing to share? 
Um, I was not on the ground for combat, but I did fly on 32 combat sorties over Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, at the time, actually I was on the first AWACS combat sortie after, um, to return to the desert in 2007. That was April 2nd, 2007. I believe it was over Iraq. Um, so they, it is considered combat, but it wasn't on the ground. It was combat sorties. So we were trying to protect the airspace of Iraq and Afghanistan, as well as we did work with protection of individuals on the ground. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so how did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? When I was deployed? Mm -hmm. Um, well, we mainly used email. Um, there were a lot of individuals who would use FaceTime once FaceTime became more prevalent. Um, the um, internet connection didn't always work, so, you know, occasionally you'd see people, oh man, I was talking to my wife and it just disconnected, but I didn't usually use FaceTime uh, with my family and friends. I would usually just use email or phone calls. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. okay. Because I, I know a lot of people when they were over there, um, you know, they didn't even have any access to internet. Yes. So I yeah, that does happen. I thought I'd ask. <laughs> um, so. so when you came back home, how did you return? Um, by, by airplane or? Yes. Um, well, I went overseas a few times. Okay. The first time... When our aircraft was first brought back over to the desert to be in, in um, OEF and OIF, we actually took our aircraft over. So I flew over in our aircraft. It took us, um, there was one time, I also went before that for an exercise, and that time we actually flew directly over. It took 20.1 hours, and we went direct and got air refuel on the way. But when we went back for deployment, I believe we stopped on the way to get air refueled. Um, in, I'm sorry, excuse me, we stopped on the way to land and get fuel. Um, so one time I went over on our aircraft, another time I went over on um, military uh, contracted aircraft. Okay. And we'll come back on that too. How long did that take, the travel time? To travel over? With the stops? <laughs> oh my. It probably took, it probably took about a day. Okay. Yeah. It's <laughs> not too bad. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so when you came back, how were you received by your family and the community? Oh, the community is, was very, very supportive. And every time I went, I was in Oklahoma, so I can speak to Oklahoma and, and those residents there. They're all very supportive. Um, usually we would return to actually the base, so um, we were, uh, they were limited to who could access the base. But um, the Oklahoma City community and Midwest City and all those little towns around there, they always support the military, you know, the discounts and the cheering and the flags and all that. So we were all very well welcomed when we came back. Okay. <laughs> um, so how did you readjust to civilian life after you've gotten out? Um, oh, after I've gotten out? <laughs> well, huh? Yeah, sorry. Um, it... I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> sorry. Oh, well, you're fine. <laughs> if, you, if you want time to think about her, I can go to another question. Um, it's okay. I'll just, um... Okay. Well, when I left the service um, in 2012, my first, obviously, uh, big priority was finding another job, sure. you know, so I'm, I was here in Dayton, Ohio, um, had just left, transitioned out of service out of Wright Pat, and there actually happened to be a hiring freeze on the base, so I was a little um, bummed about that because I wanted to go back and work on the base and give back in the civilian sector as a government civilian. Um, I was able to find a position that was very similar to what I had been doing here at Wright Pat as a contractor, so my transition um, wasn't um, as difficult as you might hear for some other people who um, sometimes you hear on the news they just are having they're struggling so much. I also have the resources around this Dayton area, which are great. Mm -hmm. You got the universities, right? you got the base, you got uh, places, um, you the VA, and um, I've also found them to be very helpful to me as well. Um, so my transition has not been um, as, uh, I guess, uh, as challenging as some people have had. However, um, it is challenging to me um, in the fact that in the military you have a lot of camaraderie. You have the same mission. You work together and you help each other out no matter what. And, you know, since I've left the service, I, I'm thinking everybody does that and I'm back in the real world now. So, um, you know, without giving examples, there are people that won't help you. They'll, they'll smile to your face and tell you one thing. And So that's something I've been struggling with. <clears throat> 
I've never understood why um, you wouldn't assist somebody. But mm -hmm. I've had to, you know, go home at night sometimes after some random experience and and just remind myself, you know, not not everybody is is out there unfortunately to work well with everybody else. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen in the military, but we have such tight experiences that it's less likely, in my opinion, that um, that you'd see somebody um, not with uh, not helping out the group. So that's been something I've, I've uh, had a challenge with is, you know, who do you, you, I go trusting everybody, but they don't always work out. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Yeah. So um, have you thought about like re-enlisting at all or? Um, at this point, you know, when I left the service, um, I had questions, should I, should it have happened, you know, things like that. Um, there are things I miss, um, there are things I don't miss. I don't miss taking a physical fitness test over here. <laughs> yeah. um, I'd miss the camaraderie. Um, I, I did think about it at one point, um, but you know, there are pros to being a civilian as well and a veteran. Um, I, I was able to serve and provide my country in my way. Other people serve and provide in their own way, whether or not they've served in the military. So um, at this point, um, I do, do not plan on, on re-enlisting, recommissioning, but um, I did have that thought at one point. <laughs> okay. Um, so uh, what do you do now? Right. For my job? Mm -hmm. um, I work at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base as a management analyst. And I currently work for uh, Brigadier General, um, and we prepare, I work in an office of three people, and we prepare him for, for business trips, for meetings, um, if he has visitors coming in, um, and we work in uh, foreign military sales, so the organization as a whole provides um, opportunities for foreign militaries to purchase aircraft, munitions, radar, construction, uh, for other countries, and we work with about 105 other countries at about 155 billion a year. Wow. Okay. <laughs> That's very exciting mm -hmm. to be a part of. Um, <clears throat> so you did say that you remain in contact with uh, everybody that you were, were uh, like you were working with or deployed with. And, mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. That's mm -hmm. great. Um, so are you a member of any of the veterans organizations? I am. Um, like the VFW? I'm a member of MOA, Military Officers Association of America. I'm not a member of VFW, DAV, or any of those at this point. I'm still researching which ones I'd like to become a member of. Okay. Um, I am a part of um, an org, well, it's kind of a grassroots, it's a Dayton Women's Veterans Collaborative. Uh, we meet each month uh, here in Dayton. We meet at different um, places each month to, to um, uh, allow each people in different geographic locations to not have to drive so far every time. Uh, so that that's a one of the groups that I go to on a regular basis. And, and what is that um, exactly? Do you guys go out and community service, or is it more like outings for dinner? Or it started as just meeting. So we would meet at like a Panera Bread type of place, and uh, where you could easily just grab at some tables and put them together. Um, we would meet every month. Um, it was started by Miss Cheryl Malone, who's a retired lieutenant colonel. She lives here in uh, Dayton, Ohio now. Um, so it started off as just meetings, um, getting together a collaborative, like, for example, um, explaining what Veterans Voices is, you know, things like that. Um, explaining, hey, by the way, ladies, um, XYZ is coming up later next week in case you're interested in going. Um, we have extended it to, we're going to begin doing some community service. We have done some other social events where we've done um, those painting classes together. So we try and do that. And of course, it's whoever can come can come. Um, we try and keep costs low because we realize not everybody, um, especially let's say someone's a student, you know, they're on a limited income. So we try and keep the activities where either costs are low or will help other people out if they're interested. So that's kind of what we do. That's exciting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, so how are you affiliated with the Honor Flight? Oh, Honor Flight. <laughs> How'd you hear about Honor Flight? <laughs> um, sorry. No, 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 you're okay. So, um, sorry. how I learned about the Honor Flight is, um, one of my friends, um, she took me over to when the, the veterans came back from D.C. and we cheered okay. for them to come back. I was just curious. No, 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 so, uh, we contacted them and in November they had a reception. Yeah. So, were you there? Oh, yeah, that's how you knew I was. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was just. I apologize. No, you're okay. Sorry, do you want to ask the question again? No, you're okay. So, uh, so how were you uh, affiliated with the Honor Flight? 
Well, before I left Tinker Air Force Base in Oklahoma, I had seen a snippet on their news about an honor flight that had returned. Um, at the time, unfortunately, I was PCSing. I was moving to Wright-Patterson, so I couldn't I could have learned about them, but I wouldn't have been able to help them. So when I moved to Wright-Patterson, I looked into Honor Flight to see what was around here, and there happened to be an Honor Flight Dayton. I emailed them, and they, and, you know, I said, hey, I'm interested in learning about your organization, maybe helping out volunteering. And uh, since then, about for about three years, I've been one of the regular volunteers. So in the morning of the flights, the veterans show up at the airport very early, like 4, 3.30, okay? Um, I'll show up there. Uh, to help with checking them in, stuff like that, to help uh, coordinate, excuse me, the veterans, I'm sorry, the volunteers, because we have more volunteers come in. And we'll get them on the, uh, through the security and, out, and up on the plane. And then in the evening, um, I'll sit at the merchandise table and sell the merchandise, which is what I was doing at the um, banquet oh, okay. in November. I was sitting there selling merchandise. Um, so I've... Um, I love that organization. Um, they started as, war as taking World War II veterans back in 2005, I believe, out of Springfield, Ohio, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and since then, since we're losing so many World War II veterans, those numbers are dwindling. So um, a lot of the Honor Flight hubs, because there's several of them around the country, have opened up to um, Korean War, some Vietnam War. And then Honor Flight Dayton actually has um, a program where if, let's say, it's a very young veteran, um, OEF, OIF veteran, but they're terminally ill. They get first, they get first chance at the flight because they're not going to be around much longer. So even though they don't have a, a memorial out there in D.C., they get to go if they want to go. So I love the organization. I talk about them at work. I send <laughs> emails getting people, hey, come out. They're doing a, they're doing a flight tonight or Saturday usually. They're doing a flight Saturday. So um, try and promote them because they are a great organization. Yeah. Um, and I've also been. Um, I've also been a guardian on that. So if you have, let's say, a World War II veteran that's going, each one has to have a guardian. Um, and that doesn't mean legal guardian. That just means someone that watches over them while they're there, make sure they're happy, make sure you know if they need assistance going to the restaurant or whatever it might be, getting a drink. Um, you're their person. So I've been able to do that with Honor Flight Dayton and with Honor Flight Tri-State. Um, back on um, September 22nd, 2015, they had the first all-female Honor Flight in the entire country. Really? And they only took guardians that were women veterans as well. So I applied for that. That's um, amazing. And they chose me. So I felt so honored to be able to take another female. I mean, I don't care if it's a female or male, but this was an amazing flight to be able to take a female veteran uh, to to DC to see her memorial. She was a she was a Marine. So <laughs> what what war did she serve in? She was in um I believe she was in Vietnam. Oh wow. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that's great. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um was there anything else um since separating from the military that you haven't mentioned that you've been doing? Um <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> okay, I just didn't know if there is any other, like, I, I guess civilian organizations you're part of. Uh, I am a vol I do volunteer a lot. Um, I do, this doesn't, since I left the military, I've volunteered during my military time with, like, animal rescue groups. Yeah, so um, here in Dayton, I volunteer with Dayton, uh, excuse me, the Humane Society of Greater Dayton, mm -hmm. as well as um, SICSA, uh, which is another animal rescue group. Um, Lately, I haven't been able to go as much because life has come, you know, life happens, so I've been busy, but um, I am a volunteer for them as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, have you had the chance to use your GI Bill or your post-9-11? I have. Um, I, uh, I initially paid into the Montgomery GI Bill um, for the year that they have you pay into that. Um, when I left the service, I decided to get a, uh, an, excuse me, an MBA. So I did use part of my GI Bill for that. Um, I do have some time left on it, so um, maybe in the next, I think I have 13 years left to use it, I'll maybe I'll find something else to continue to use that on. Okay, so what are your degrees in? Um, I have a bachelor's degree in communications from Hanover College, which is in Indiana. And I have um, an, a master's in human relations from University of Oklahoma, and my MBA is from Keller Graduate School of Management, and I attended the campus here in Dayton. Okay, mm -hmm. great. So if you were to go back to school, <laughs> do you have any ideas? Like, I, um, I'm somebody that really likes helping people, so it would probably be more social sciences. Um, I really like sociology, um, 
psychology, things like that. Um, I didn't know I liked it during my bachelor's, so I didn't really study it then. Um, and the degree at um, University of Oklahoma was more in the social sciences, um, so it would probably be something in that realm, okay. sociology area. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, um, how did your wartime experiences affect your life now? Well, it, it brings an aspect to how you think about everything. Um, you see students, you see people in general in this country who have a lot just because they live in this country. And you go overseas to help other people in other countries and they are so um, appreciative of the assistance they get. So when I ha have any experience here in, in the U.S. or even when I go abroad, because I do travel a lot, um, I take the experiences that I had uh, in combat um, and it just brings a different perspective for me. Like, sometimes I come, you know, everybody does this. Well, why did this happen to me? And then I think, I have everything I could ever want in this country. I shouldn't be complaining. So based on, that's partially based on the deployment experience. Okay. So you, you mentioned that you, you travel a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, have, uh, have you gone back to... Um, Barbados or, <laughs> or any, like where do you travel? I have gone back to Barbados um, on a cruise, so oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a little different. Um, <laughs> I have been on a few cruises um, in the last year, so mainly those were Caribbean cruises, um, places I hadn't been before, mainly like the, the St. Martin and the islands that all start with St. or um, <laughs> Antigua, Barbados, um, went to Mexico. Um, I took a trip to Iceland with my stepmother uh, in 2014. Um, that country is amazing, um, beautiful, um, very friendly people. Um, friendly people everywhere, to be honest, but th they were just amazing there. Um, uh, where else have I gone? I mean, I've been to other places before, before I left the service. <laughs> I've been to Japan, um, I studied abroad in Australia, um, Norway, some countries in Europe. Okay. Okay. So, um, are you married? Do you have kids or anything? I'm not married, and I don't have kids. I have two cats. <laughs> Cat people unite. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, and, and I, I'm not sure if well, I feel like you might have already answered this, but in case there's anything else you want to add, <clears throat> um, what are some like life lessons you've learned from the military service? understand a situation before you judge it um, and have perspective absolutely because you never know where someone's coming from I've had some people come to me as um, as their supervisor when I was in the military who had issues going on and you know you're always going to have a first thought but until you let them tell you why they have an issue or that they have something going on that you didn't know about that's one of the things I've learned don't judge before you know what's going on Absolutely, and that goes for you know, in my, in my opinion, for if you're working with someone as a supervisor or as a supervisee, or if you have someone on the street that just comes up and asks you for help. <laughs> so, how has the military um, impacted your feelings about war and the military in general? Um, <laughs> it's a loaded question. I love the military. Um, if I wish we didn't need it, but unfortunately we do, you know, because you have to have something that keeps your country and the world safe, if need be. So I wish we didn't have a job, <laughs> but it's unfortunate that we do. Um, so, and, and I support anything military related, um, if you're, you know, the organizations. Um, you know, the decision makers, the people that, make, that decide whether we're going to um, help or take care of a situation, that's not something I can control. So whether or not I agree with, with something, you know, I can't do much about that. Um, but I do absolutely support the people that are told they have to go into the into theater, wherever they're told that they have to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so what message would you like to leave for future generations who will uh, view and hear this message? Oh my God. <laughs> what message would I like to leave? <laughs> Hold on. Yeah, you're right. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a father on my
<coughs> Can you repeat it? What message would I like to leave for? What message would you like to leave for future generations who will watch this interview? For anyone considering the military or civilians just listening to a military uh, member's perspective on their experience. Military members absolutely, and their families, absolutely appreciate the support. Um, they can feel when the community support them. So um, absolutely, um, continue supporting, continue saying thank you. There are some veterans out there that say, I don't need to be thanked. Deep down, they probably appreciate just knowing. Um, for individuals who may be considering military service, um, I know sometimes people um, say, I would never tell a woman to join the military. I would absolutely tell a woman to join the military. Um, but that's my opinion. Um, other people have experiences or, um, or uh, opinions that might be different. My opinion is um, I had excellent experiences. If I had issues in the military, I did have resources that I could go to. So um, if you're considering um, joining the military, um, do your research. Find out if you think that it might be something for you. It's not for everybody. But um, you will be scared at some time, just, just knowing that there will be a big change, whether it's military or another job. So um, there will be some uh, hesitation, even if you do sign on the dotted line and say you're going to go. But, push through that change and know that you have resources out there and you have prior veterans that will help you if you need it. That's good. <laughs> um, so is there anything you feel that we haven't discussed or should be added? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well that concludes our interview and thank you for your service. Thank you. <laughs>